Thank you. Thanks so much to Peter and Zena and uh, Kaylin, Nancy, and the late Fred Bass for letting us do events in this beautiful rare books room. And you guys, please support independent bookstores. None of my students, you're, you're not allowed to buy books on Amazon. You can only buy books where you could have readings, big, beautiful readings, or else there won't be any place to buy readings. And by the way, they have great tchotchkes downstairs and uh, notebooks and uh, bags, strand bags and cards and stuff like that. So thank you all for coming. And um, when we were talking about dates and when they mentioned 9-11, I know it was a sad day, but I thought, and I was, I was downtown um, and actually hanging out with students um, when we were all shocked 17 years ago, but I actually thought that it might be a really good um, night for this because I teach at NYU in the new school and I have so many students who have published really beautiful pieces so I thought um, we could we could take a horrible day and make it inspiring and actually I always love to say that um, uh, writing is a way to turn your, your most horrible experiences into the most beautiful and that's what a lot of the people have done tonight. So um, in my book, The Byline Bible, get published in five weeks, I was able to include um, 60 pieces that students of mine have published for my classes and also link a whole bunch of other fantastic pieces that I love. So what I thought we would do is let's we're gonna hear some of these really short, beautiful published pieces out loud and then after we hear the pieces, um, people I'm sitting at the panel with found a way to um, write short pieces and turn them into books. And so we'll do a Q&A, and if anybody has any questions about how do you start with a short piece and make it into a book, both fiction and nonfiction, um, we'll take questions. But anyway, so to start off with, um, uh, Ralph Ortiz is gonna come read um, his first published piece um, that he sold to AM New York and the Newsday editor. And if anybody happens to have um, uh, my book and wants to follow along, it's on um, page, say it again? Page 184, and uh, hang on, let me get it. It's uh, 184, and it's called, um, This Selfie Will Be for the Ages. So Ralph, why don't you come up and read it out loud? Great, Ralph Ortiz. I tend to read fast when I get nervous, so if I start to read fast, just raise your hand and I'll slow down. Talk closer into the mic. So if I start to read fast, just raise your hand and I'll try to slow down. My 21-year-old daughter Mimi loves Bernie Sanders and sharing her life through social media. I was with Hillary Clinton and I'm sick of social media, yet we share one thing in common. We're graduating college in May. Mimi is a senior at St. John's University while I'm at the new school. We share study sessions and she's even asked for my help. She went to college at 18. My wife and I worked hard for that, for that to happen. I didn't want her to be like me. It took me 24 years to get here. I dropped out of high school at 16. I tried to earn a degree at that time, but school was interrupted by marriage, parenthood, and homelessness. Last fall, Mimi and I met at Washington Square Park, and I walked toward NYU's Elmer Holmes Bobes Library. We sat on a bench, and I turned to her. When I was in New York University, I was homeless and slept on this very bench. What happened? Mimi asked in shock. I was a clerk at an insurance company, and, and that, that, I, was, I was a clerk at an insurance company that took a financial hit paying policyholders impacted by a hurricane. When the dust settled, I got $1,000 in severance pay. I had fallen behind on my rent by two months. I had the money, but paid my tuition at NYU. My landlord was a friend, so I thought he wouldn't mind. He did. After I was laid off, I went to see my then girlfriend who had invited me to lunch. I was happy to see her, but before I could tell her what happened, she said, we need to take a break. We need to, we need to break up. I was starting to get busy. She was starting to get busy with classes and hospital rotations and didn't have time for me. Two days later, after looking for work, I came home. I was seeing the landlord stood by my door. You gotta leave, he said. A month later, I was still sleeping on the streets. I hated the stigma of being poor. I didn't say anything to my family or friends. At 4.45 one morning, a police officer woke me up and said that sleeping in the park was, wasn't allowed. I walked out reaching a garbage can on the corner of Waverly and Washington. I was hungry, so I went digging. 
The first time I ate from the garbage, I had a bologna sandwich with mayo. Disgusting. I still have my NYU ID card, so I sneaked into the, um, the recreation center for a quick shower. Home, homeless and 22, I didn't have the skills or degree to get a job. I wanted, to go, I wanted to go to the public assistance office, but pride would not let me. During my time at NYU, I met Jim Redondo, a 50-year-old NYU employee. He hired me for a temporary job and allowed me to stay in the empty rooms of the dormitories I had to work in. To get me started, he gave me clothes, money, and a job as a janitor and painter at NYU. After I told him the story, there was a long pause. So my dad slept on a park bench and ate from the garbage, she asked. I knew things were gonna get better, I said. Later, Mimi and I went, went to the library. We read, took notes, and shared highlighters. On graduation day, the one selfie I want is of, of Mimi and I in our cap and gowns. That picture I post on Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram. Thank you. That was Ralph Ortiz, and I should say for the people that don't know me or haven't taken my class that the first assignment I give is write about your most humiliating secret, and that assignment has so many people published great pieces, and um, um, the editor from uh, Eli Reyes from Newsday and AM New York, we recently, he came to my NYU class, and we said to him, um, what's your favorite piece that you've published, and he mentioned Ralph's piece. Thank you. Cool. Cheers, hurry up, come sit to, up. to be fair, I took her class twice, and the first time, I was just, an, I was an idiot. And it's, it's one, one of those stories that you think you know more than the professor, and I chose to ignore whatever she was saying so I didn't get published. So the second time I took the class, I totally paid attention and, and I got published, so. That was his first publication. Come sit down, Cherise. Okay, so next I want to, I want to bring up, um, again, a, a brilliant humiliation essay, Victor Vernando, um, and he wrote a piece called I Stole a White Girl and Took Her to Prom. And if anybody's interested, it's on 60, page 69. So Victor's going to read that out loud. Hey, everybody. I'm Victor Vernando. That's okay. <laughs> I love you anyway. Um, my prom date's parents has no, had no idea that their white daughter would spend an evening with a black man. Uh, for starters, they didn't know I was black. As an African-American man born with albinism, I have seen the look of awareness creep across faces when people set aside their initial assessment based on my light skin and hair and finally figure out that I am black. As they come to terms with this realization, their silent reactions range from the harmless, well, I'll be. I had no idea you even existed. To the irrational, I've been betrayed. Why did you trick me? Moments like this, moments like these have plagued my life. For me, high school began with ostracism. I was teased about my very light hair and skin, lazy eye, and Coke bottle glasses. But as I matured from a terrified freshman to a more confident senior, my classmates' attitude toward me transformed dramatically. The most important change for me was that suddenly women didn't find me revolting. The first thing I wanted to do with my newly acceptable level of attractiveness was ask my friend Kate to prom. Kate had dark hair, a great sense of humor, boobs, and combat boots, everything that at 18 I felt was important. Although she listened to better music than I did, she liked the replacements while I liked AHA, Kate did think it, I was cool enough to hang out with intermittently. Sometimes we met for lunch in the concrete commons area separating the two buildings comp uh, compromising Minneapolis North High School's campus. We would slowly chew breaded chicken breasts while uh, criticizing everyone else's clothes. Uh, before asking Kate out, I watched her from the inside of the glass double doors of the southern building until I could slow down my breathing enough to feel normal. I left the safety of the doorway and asked, will you go to prom with me? She paused, looked surprised, smiled, and then agreed to the date. Every time I saw her, uh, I, every time I saw her for the next day, she smiled or blushed. I wondered if this was what dating felt like. Then, she, then the following afternoon, Kate greeted me in the lunchroom with tears in her eyes. I'm sorry, she said. Although we were surrounded by cafeteria commotion, it felt like she and I were alone. My, my parents won't let me go to prom with you, she stammered. Why? I was so confused. Because you're black. She said it like maybe I should have known. I was genuinely surprised. My whole life, people, 
Uh, my whole life, people shunned me for looking different, but never for my race. Apparently, when Kate told her parents uh, she had been asked to prom, she pointed me out in the yearbook to her mother, who thought I was different looking, but nice enough. Her father, on the other hand, took one look at my photo and had questions. What is he? He asked. Kate said that I was black, that both my parents are black. Through a genetic anomaly, they produced a child like me. The look on Kate's face filled in the rest of the story. She turned around and left the lunchroom as quickly as she could. I was left standing alone, surrounded by everyone I knew. That evening, I broke the news to my friends Dave and Pete. The three of us had planned a triple date to the prom. We were renting a limo together. Now, with Kate pulling out of our date, our entire evening was, was harpooned. Uh, but I've always been a fan of John Hughes movies, especially his romantic comedies like Sixteen Candles. Molly Ringwald took an incredible... <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. Molly Ringwald took an incredible risk before uh, landing her true love, so why couldn't I come up with my own madcap scheme to win Kate's heart? What would happen if I sent one of my incredibly white friends to Kate's house on prom night? Maybe I could fool her parents into thinking she was going to the dance with a safe Caucasian male. Pete and Dave were in. I just had to pick my proxy. Pete was my hunkiest buddy. His father was an ex-Marine and his brother was a fireman. He came from Nordic stock. Every time a new attractive girl moved to our school uh, district, it was inevitable that he would end up in bed with her. Was I handing Kate over to him? Pete was definitely not the guy for the job. Dave was a tall and nerdy German kid with blonde hair and thick glasses. I would find out later that Dave got more action than anybody, but at the time, he made me feel safe. The next day, I presented the idea to Kate over lunch. She was flabbergasted at the plan uh, for Dave to be our ethnic beard, but she, I'm sorry, for Dave to be our ethnic beard, but she agreed to play along. On the night of the dance, Dave, Pete, their dates, and I all arrived outside of Kate's house in a limo. I had picked a cummerbund and bow tie to match Kate's blue dress, so Dave and I switched our Dave and I switched our tuxedo accessories to avoid any suspicion. Pete and I watched from the limousine as Kate's father greeted Dave and ushered him into their living room for pictures. It was surreal. Part of me felt so smart that I had come up with a way to trick Kate's parents. I also felt like a creep hiding in a car while a white guy posed with my prom day. Eventually, Kate and Dave emerged and jumped into the limo. I stayed hidden until the car door closed and we were all safe behind privacy glass. Once Dave and I switched our accessories back, Kate and I sat next to each other awkwardly, not touching at all. That evening, we danced, we bowled, and we held hands. By the end of the night, as the limo dropped, dropped other kids off one by one, Kate and I had grown bold. We pulled up outside of Kate's house. We stood on her sidewalk. If Kate's mother had looked out of her window right then, she would have seen us. Kate and I leaned in for a kiss. We may have been too excited because we bumped teeth. We were both too embarrassed to correct our mistake, so the fumbled kiss was all we had. Years later, when Kate was in her early 20, 20s, and sitting in the back seat of her parents' uh, station wagon on a family trip, she decided it was time to tell uh, them that she spent prom with that black kid who didn't really look black. Her father kept driving but screamed, what? In an exaggerated cartoon fashion. He wasn't a fan. Kate's mother responded just the way a movie mom might. I knew it, she said, laughing. Kate and I didn't end up together, but the part of our, our short relationship that I kept has affected my dealings with intimacy since. Life rewarded me for taking a chance. My experience with Kate became a seminal moment. Risk became my blueprint for how relationships that were worth it began. Most of the time, most of the time, uh, seizing the moment led to something exceptional. When I sparked a conversation on Facebook with a woman I'd never met, she asked if I would meet her in New Orleans after she finished with her stint rebuilding houses shortly after Hurricane Katrina. I agreed. We met for the first time at a boutique hotel on Bourbon Street and enjoyed three days of dancing, jazz, gumbo, and gambling. We toured an almost empty aquarium aquarium in the midst of being uh, restocked after the storm since since the rules were lax, I got to pet my first penguin. Of course, taking chances has sometimes led to terrible things, but even though I woke up to an empty wallet and a missing phone after almost a week of hanging out with a poet from Kansas who to this day swears she will pay me back, I still enjoyed the conversation, the affection, and joy she gave me before she robbed me blind.
And that was um, Victor Bernardo, who's a stand-up comic, and that was in Salon, and he also sold a great piece to Vice, and he's working on a, a humorous, humorous essays, I think, called Colorblind. Okay, the next reader is Enma Elias, and she's reading the first piece she ever published in the Wall Street Journal, and it's on page 72. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, hola, mija, how are you? My mom, Rosa, texted me last month. I hesitated before replying that I had woken up again with, to that sharp pain behind my eyelids. Like her, I was born with granular dystrophy, a rare eye condition that occasionally causes eruptions and leaves scar tissue on my corneas. Whenever I mentioned it, my usually chirpy mom would wilt. I gave you all that is bad, she would sigh. She felt responsible for my affliction. For a long time, I blamed her too. My mom was diagnosed in 1991, long after her vision had began to fail. She was 27 and I was four. We had arrived in the US after fleeing Guatemala Civil War. Back home, proper health care had been rare and expensive. We came to California to live with my dad, Hernan, a cook who worked 16 hours a day to bring us to America. My mom eventually learned to drive, but often, especially at night, she depended on my dad and later my brother and me. Since I also had the disease, I joked that it was like the blind leading the blind when we would try to find our way driving slowly and squinting at, at, ma at road signs while cars honked behind us. When my eruptions came, the loss of vision and pain were debilitating to the point of depression. Light was excruciating and I retreated to a darkened room for days at a time. My mom soothed me and, I bl and blamed herself. I stood in silent agreement. After she turned 50, she was referred to an ophthalmologist who specialized in rare diseases. He was fascinated by her condition. Soon the room was filled with excited young physicians who'd never seen a real life case. She needed surgery, and the doctor battled her insurance company for months until it approved two corneal transplants. I had been so concerned with my own struggle that I hadn't noticed hers, but I felt a pang of anxiety as I imagined her driving home from, the for, from her housekeeping job during the winter when the sun sat before she left. After the first surgery, I picked her up from outpatient care. A week later, her other cornea was replaced. Colors are brighter, she said. My congratulatory smile hid more than a touch of sadness. My roommates and boyfriend worried that they sometimes found me hanging out in the dark. How high I had not realized all the lights were off. A selfie revealed a trail of faint freckles across my cheeks, which I had not noticed. My friends laughed and said, yes, you've always had those. I asked my doctor about surgery, but he said I didn't need it yet. This was infuriating, but I was no longer angry with my mom. I realized that my parents had left their country and sacrificed every day to give me and my brother a better life. They made sure I got checkups and glasses, braces, shots. I've earned a college degree in English and am now studying journalism at the new school. When I told my mom that I had inherited her freckles, she inspected my face proudly. Mija, your, fish, your vision is fine, your life is good. She was right. She bequeathed to me not only her freckles and deteriorating eye disease, but also everything good in my life that she'd never had growing up. It's uh, Emma Elias. And after she published her piece in the Wall Street Journal, she's been working at Tin House Literary Magazine. So congratulations. OK, so the next reader is Haig Chahanian, and he's reading a piece on page 60 that was in Oprah Magazine. So I, when, it, when he got it in, I was like, congratulations. Fuck you, Oprah. Oh my god, $3 a word. I'm jealous. OK, so th uh, the truth is that racism is everywhere. $2 a word. Um, Sue asked us not to thank anybody up here, but Sue, I appreciate you so much. And I'm grateful. Uh, I called this the, the least likely racist. Uh, got changed to the truth is that racism is everywhere. When my husband and I adopted our newborn biracial daughter, I proudly snapped photos of her and pasted them to handwritten announcements I sent everyone we knew. I instantly loved this child. I vowed to carve out a world for her that was free of bigotry, including bigotry against gay men like her two dads. Her picture book showed people of every shade. We moved to Harlem so she could see tykes like herself on the playground. As she's grown, she's 11 now, I always thought I was succeeding. But there was that bright, bracing autumn day two years ago when she and I went on a hike in the Hudson Valley. Wet leaves plastered the ground, a breeze chilled our ears, and my daughter pushed her mocha-skinned bitty twin doll in a stroller, straggling several yards behind me as I ascended the trail. And then I rounded a bend and saw a black man walking toward me. I froze. The back of my neck tensed. Adrenaline shot through my limbs. I registered quickly that he was moving quickly. Separated from my daughter, my instinct was to protect her, to call out to her. But what would I call? Careful, here comes someone else enjoying the scent of pine needles. By the time my girl and the oncoming hiker reached me simultaneously, my panic had subsided. He smiled at us as he passed, using both hands to wave hello, as if he were in a parade. 
Embarrassed, I greeted him with a nod. During my childhood, my Armenian parents cursed the Ottomans of the Turkish Empire that murdered all eight of my great-grandparents because of their ethnicity. Yet I was forbidden to play inside the home of our African-American neighbors. My folks saw no link between their intolerance and the Turks' ethnic cleansing. Now, ambling with my daughter, I was overcome with shame. I hated that seeing a dark-skinned man had frightened me so easily, especially since my own child had a similar complexion. I'd felt the same split-second impulse as the men who shot Alton Sterling and Tamir Rice, one similar to gay panic, the urge to harm a queer person like me after perceiving a threat. And then I remembered, when the backpacker said hello, he'd raised his palms on either side of his head, as if to show he was unarmed. It looked like surrender, to me, his progressive, gay, urbanite aggressor. When we adopted our daughter, I worried I wasn't prepared for the challenge of raising a child of color. Still, we took comfort in the fact that we were enlightened, that we knew better, that we were better. Hell, I'd even studied racial identity development in college. But none of that had inoculated me against racist hair trigger fear. My daughter and I paused to catch our breath under a canopy of maple leaves. I reached into my knapsack and handed her a bag of dried fruit and nuts. She put a cranberry to the lips of her doll, then munched on it herself. Breathing in the mountain air, I recalled a saying that likened, likened racism to smog. Although sometimes hard to see, it's everywhere. It's my job to both recognize its presence and fight against it, day by day, step by step. And um, I always tell my students that clips are like crack. You can't just have one. And Haig has also been in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, everywhere. Um, OK, so um, the Byline Bible, as I mentioned, it's, um, it's basically how I teach my classes. So I thought I would read a funny section, a very short, funny section. And it's called Cover Letters We Never Finished Reading. So these are, these are not the cover letters that everybody sent out to get published. These are the opposite. So it's on page 117, number one. So these are cover letters are when you're ready to send in a piece. This is what you write to an editor uh, to start. So number one, number one, though I've never heard of your magazine before. <laughs> number two, while I haven't published anything in my whole life and only get rejections. Number three, to whom it may concern. Number four, excuse the typos, misspellings, and mistakes. I'm sending this on the jitney to the Hamptons from my iPhone. <laughs> number five, I read about your promotion to editor-in-chief and wondered what kind of stuff you buy. Number six, I'm going to Japan. Need anything? Number seven, I just graduated Phi Beta Kappa, and my journalism professor found my work brilliant, so I thought you would too. Number eight, although you already ran four pieces on this topic this month, nine, I'm giving you 24 hours to be the first to publish my exclusive piece on 10. Hey, dude, what's up? 11, I already published this on my website, blog, and Huffington Post, but hoped you'll rerun it. 12, as a student who detests the media and agrees with the president that it's unfair and elitist. 13, I hated the right-wing screed you ran by your staff writer last week, so I'm sure you'll want my essay telling the true story. Number 14, you don't know me, but I'll phone you later to discuss my important piece. 15, I've just completed 100,000 words of my debut novel, which I'm sure you'll want to read, even though your website says you only publish nonfiction. Number 16, before submitting my piece, I want to find out what you pay and if, you'll be able to keep, if I'll be able to keep the rights for the book this is excerpted from. Number 17, my shrink encouraged me to send this out despite my fear of success and suicidal feelings when it comes to failure. Number 18, the other editors you work with said no to this piece, but they just didn't get it. Number 19, my name is Lisa. I'm a freshman from Ohio taking music and journalism classes, although my parents really wanted me to study business. 20, my teacher Susan Shapiro told me to send this to you since you've paid a lot of money to all her students in the past and they get book deals and I want one too. <laughs> okay, so next to me is Cherise Tracy and she has published everywhere. How many clips now? I don't know. Like 50, probably 50 in um, the New York Times and a Day Magazine and in Essence and all over the place. And so she's gonna read the very first piece she published in my class in the New York Times called A Military Mom Goes Back to School. Cherise Tracy. Thank you. On my first day of school, I cried, Mommy, what if they're all smarter than me? I wasn't a first grader. I was a 40-year-old army wife, a mother of four, and a new student. My mother feared getting a graduate degree would be too difficult and expensive for me. As far as expensive went, she was right. Tuition was 25000 the first year. My supportive, albeit understand understandably preoccupied husband was on orders to deploy to Afghanistan. My son and daughter were starting preschool and kindergarten. My 70-year-old needed books. 
His older brother went to community college out of state, and my mom at 67 had just moved in with us so I could arrange her, arrange her medical treatment. Anyone would tell you the timing was terrible, but I had been underemployed for years. I wanted to invest in a chance to study something I loved. When the minority and military grants I expected to supplement my scholarship with fell through, I took out loans, parked my seven-passenger child-friendly minivan at the train station, and took Metro North to Grand Central Terminal to restart my life as a student. In every way, it was a longer trip than I expected. As an African-American high school dropout with a college degree from a school that didn't require a high school degree for admission, I was intimidated by institutions of higher learning. Becoming a mother did not change that. In my first writing workshop, we discussed a term called I-dialect, a phrase used to describe a writer's use of non-standard spelling to establish that a character spoke in a, in a particular way. Someone said the protagonist was uneducated. What some refer to as street talk is becoming part of everyday language, I argued. It doesn't mean he's, he's not smart, but I was too embarrassed to go on. My classmates from privileged backgrounds and Ivy League campuses had MacBooks and iPhones that talked. I was an older outsider, a minority, and a broke mom. I apologized for my outburst and wound up confessing to a room full of 25-year-olds that I had been accepted into their program even though I didn't finish high school. Everyone was silent. I was the oldest in the class next to our professor. I sensed he understood. He outlined his bottom lip with his thumb and said, we need passionate people in the program. I was humiliated and didn't want to return, but I had already accepted financial aid. It took me more time getting to school than I spent there. With children at home and a husband in harm's way, I feared I was wasting my time and money. When my military marriage brought me to New York, I never realized my confidence was geographical. When I lived on the West Coast, being a mother of four attending classes earned me respect. Here, my status seemed like a downer to artistic classmates and brilliant professors who never brought it up. Luckily, I was blessed with a great family and a babysitter. I worked a part-time job for a year to afford school. When I told my four-year-old son that I had a bad day, he offered to get Spider-Man to help. My five-year-old daughter wanted to take me to the American Girl store. I hoped to provide a good role model for them, but found inspiration in my kids' confidence in me. I was haunted by my confession. Then a fellow student emailed that I looked too young to have four children. What was my secret, she wanted to know. On my 41st birthday, another classmate, Margaret, brought me cupcakes. I almost cried, but this time out of happiness. I was touched by the thoughtfulness of these young adults. School improved each term. Now I proudly show pictures of my kids on my phone. I wasn't the most confident person in that class, but eventually I was proud that I had shared my fears. Now, in my second year, you can't shut me up. And um, my two favorite stories about Charisse is her writing got so well known that Roxanne Gay called her and said, would you be in my anthology, Not That Bad? And so she has a piece in the new anthology. And then personally, my favorite story is I've been trying to get into Elle magazine for years and had no luck. And so Charisse had done a great piece in my class for Day magazine. And all of a sudden, I see she's in Elle magazine, too. And I'm like, how'd you do it? And she's like, well, the editor just emailed me and said, can I rerun this? And I'm like, could I get her name and email? She said, yeah. So usually, I tell my students, they could say, Susan Shapiro gave me your name. This time, I said, my student Charisse gave me your email. I loved her piece. And then they bought my first piece. So. Uh, that was very cool, so thank you for the connection. Um, next to me is Kenan Trebinsevic, and he's going to read a piece called The Reckoning. And um, Kenan was actually my physical therapist, and when um, exercises when you do PT are really, really boring. So I asked him, to me, sorry, and so I asked him, <laughs> I asked him where his accent was from, and we started having a long conversation, and he told me, and I said, oh, you have to write this. And he was like, who the hell would be interested? And I said, I think I know someone. So this is The Reckoning, which was in the New York Times Magazine. After reading an article on Bosnia's tourism boom, my brother Eldon and I decided it was time to face down our past. We reasoned that we were really doing this for our 72-year-old father, Sanahid. If he didn't see the country of his birth or his childhood friends soon, he never would. Yet within days, I became obsessed with creating a to-do list for our trip. One, take a picture of the concentration camp my brother and father survived. Two, visit the cemetery where the karate coach who betrayed us was buried. Three, confront Petra, the neighbor who stole from my mother. The minute we stepped out of the car in front of our old apartment building, my hands began to sweat. We fled 18 years ago, one year into the Bosnian War, and had not been back since. My father's friend truly bought our apartment as a summer home in 2006, the year my mom died of cancer. We were living in Connecticut by then. Truly and my father both worked with the city sports clubs and were close friends for 30 years. 
You and your brothers should know what your father did for the city and its people. Truly, he said when we greeted him. That's why he stayed alive. As we approached the building, I could see Truly's two pretty teenage daughters staring down at us from the third floor balcony. I was reminded of what it was like to be 12, shouting to my friends below as I rushed to get to karate practice. It still shocked me to recall that it was my coach who put in charge of the city's special police unit, arrived with the army van to cleanse the building of its Muslims. They marched to our door and told my father, you have one hour to leave or be killed. We left and went to stay with my aunt. My father and brother were picked up a month later and put into a camp. My mother and I eventually made it back to the apartment where we were all reunited three months later. We were the only Muslim family who didn't flee the building when the war began, but we lived in fear that someone would come back for us. Inside the building hadn't changed. The same possibly high steps, the same brown mailboxes. Only the tenants' names were different. After the war, this, this side of town became populated with Serbs. Bosnians like us were not a minority. As I walked into the apartment, I headed for my old bedroom. I used to lie on the floor peeping through the tiny holes in the shades that were drawn all day and night so soldiers couldn't see you and sprayed the windows with bullets. Coming up to her apartment, I passed Petra, our old neighbor. She was in her late 60s now. When she caught sight of me, she put down her grocery bags and sat on the stairs to smoke a cigarette, hoping to avoid me. I flashed back to the night she barged into our dining room and told my mother to give her the skirt she was wearing. The next day was the dining room rug Petra wanted. A week later, she invited my mother for coffee and they sat with their feet resting on stolen rug. Truly's wife promised my mother that she would never acknowledge Petra. All summer long, I walked by her as if I'm walking by grave, she said. Petra liked to tell her paramilitaries where Muslims were living so they could come and cart them away in meat trucks. Her husband, Oberyn, worked as a guard in the concentration camp. It was the same one from, my, same one from which my brother and father were miraculously released as prisoners were being transferred hours before CNN arrived to show the world atrocities. While Petra requisitioned my mother's things, Oberyn bought me canned foods and plum jam. He remembered the time my father stood up for him during a tenants meeting just before the fighting began. Years later, we learned he died of esophageal cancer. His wife has lasted almost as long as Galapagos turtles. The monsters always live. As she approached our floor, her footsteps became halting, her breathing heavy. She fumbled for her key. Her eyes didn't meet mine. No one has forgotten, I said. She put her head down. The door opened with a long sigh, then closed. There was silence. I heard laughter coming from our old living room and joined my friends inside. Truly turned to his daughters and said, if the two of you were only a few years older, you could marry one of these boys. They blushed smiling. Once they turned 18, I said, to make them less uncomfortable. Later that night, I reached into my pocket for my to-do list and crossed off item number three. And um, I always say in my book, three pages can change your life. And after that three page essay ran in the New York Times Magazine, um, he was on a radio show, a literary agent contacted him, someone from the best American essays reprinted it, and he wound up with an editor at Penguin, uh, Penguin Books, so um, someone was interested. Okay, next to him, Allison Yarrow. Now, I remember in my class, Allison published a fantastic piece um, in Newsweek. I remember, because that was like a really big deal clip, and since then I know, um, I've seen your clips all over, um, uh, New York Times, Time Magazine. Um, I remember you were an editor at The Forward, you worked at The Daily Beast, and Allison has most recently published a book um, called 90s Bitch. So instead of reading a short piece, I think you're gonna read a little from your brand new book that just came out called 90s Bitch. Thanks, Sue. <laughs> I'm gonna read the prologue. Many women remember the first time they were called a bitch in pristine detail. For me, it was at a party for my high school soccer team where I got drunk for the first time. An argument with a friend about a boy escalated into yelling and she called me a bitch. I was so startled that I slapped her in the face. It was the talk of the lunchroom the next week, in part because we had just learned about irony in English class, and my friend's last name happened to be Slappy. <laughs> Seriously. Um, being the perpetrator was humiliating. Girls didn't hit, and I had violated the code. But I had to retaliate, because innately I knew that being called a bitch was the worst possible slight. Bitch is a gendered insult with a long history of reducing women to their sexual function. 
Ancient Greeks slandered women by calling them dogs in heat who begged for men, a slur that referred to the virgin goddess, goddess Artemis, the huntress who changed herself into a wild dog. According to etymologists, the word has long been used with the intent of suppressing images of women as powerful and divine and equating them with sexually depraved beasts. From its very conception, bitch was a verbal weapon designed to restrain women and strip them of their power. Today, bitch has been spit-shined, retooled, and given new life. We hear women using it to describe one another. Boss bitch, basic bitch, and resting bitch face are as ubiquitous in are ubiquitous terms on social media, in the school lunchroom, and around the office water cooler. What was once once a derogation is now seen as an appellation of empowerment and sisterhood. But the attempt, the attempted reclamation of the word doesn't change its history or more common use. It has historically been and remains the worst invective hurled at women, one that degrades, disparages, and disenfranchises all at once. This is plainly on display in the historical record. Use of the word has increased as women have gained power and influence, specifically to undercut their achievements and stop their progress. Indeed, this is the real story of how bitch and its corollaries were deployed by misogynists in the 90s and how the word and the concept proliferated throughout society that decade. This bitch bias shaped the way a generation of women and men came of age and also this current moment. We can no longer ignore the history of bitch and how it has influenced the world we live in today. I'll use the verb bitchify and the noun bitchification to characterize how 90s media and societal narratives reduced women to their sexual function in order to thwart their progress. Thank you. Alison Yarrow, reading from 90s Bitch. And if I remember correctly, the cool thing about that was that you had published so much that didn't, uh, didn't somebody come to you, an editor come to you? So that's another exciting thing when you start publishing short pieces is an editor will come to you and say, I have a book idea, let's work on it together. Okay, next to her is Judy Battalion. And um, Judy, um, I remember, um, I think it was in my class, published a great piece in the New York Times and then started writing for the New York Times Motherload. And it led to this fantastic memoir called White Walls. And I remember you were on television with your mother on um, the Today Show. So you wanna, you wanna read a little bit from uh, White Walls? Sure. Great. This is uh, um, White Walls. Wait, let me, let me read the, um, the subtitle is White Walls, a memoir about motherhood, daughterhood, and the mess in between. It's about hoarding. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna read the first two pages of the prologue, because that's what Sue told me to do. Just <laughs> okay, prologue. Uh, it's called Voyageur, New York City, and the year is 2010. It's time, my father's voice creaks through the phone. My father has called me exactly three times since I left home in 1996 and never at 8.30 in the morning. Her threats are serious. She's really planning it, he says, the details. He doesn't make any of his usual jokes. She's plotting her plot for when she plots is or she's ready for her 72 virgins. That's how I know it really is time. I feel my esophagus battering through me like a pendulum. I'm coming. I dial my brother. Ellie, book us in at court for tomorrow morning, I say, as if I'm referring to a mani-pedi and not requesting an injunction against the woman who bore me. I hear my blood pump quick staccato. Imagine hers gushing through her thick veins. Imagine it stop. She just likes the attention, I remind myself, attempt to console myself. Eight hours from New York to Montreal. I can make it. I must. I look out of my all-window apartment at the new high-rises and old water towers, at the buzzing Mondrian grid of Manhattan streets. I see their arrangement, parallels and perpendiculars, squares, equal angles. They're numbered in order so no one ever gets lost. Someone is looking out for you. I live on the 18th floor, reminding me of Chai, the Hebrew for one and eight, the symbol for luck, the word for life. 
I am on top of things here on my mountain. I can see the moat, protect myself. What's going on? John, suited up for work, comes into the living room, which is sparse, airy, barely furnished, the exact opposite of both our mother's homes. I'm going to get the court order, I say, finally. Finally, he repeats, knowing that I've been trying to do this, waiting for my dad's support for years. I smell John's Irish spring, like the Irish are so known for cleanliness, he's been known to joke in his British accent. To me, it's the scent of savior. Call me, he says. If you're lucky, I grab his hand, he squeezes back. I memorize the pressure of his knuckles on my skin, think how our body's link is entirely different from the hydrogen bonds that hold together DNA. I am wired. It's actually happening. I have only 25 minutes to catch the bus. Within 10, I'm packed and in a taxi headed to Port Authority Station. I call mom as we start and stop in traffic around Times Square. What's going on? My stomach is clenched. I can't go on. They're coming to get me, she says. She's terrified of them. There's no point. Even God is telling me to kill myself. Well, I say, God has made a lot of mistakes. God. When has she ever once mentioned God? I try to breathe, feel the pulse in my eyes. Eight hours is a long time. I'm coming, I say, as we pass a billboard for yet another Shrek. Don't kill yourself. It's very simple. Just don't kill yourself. The concept of her non-existence short circuits my neurons. The area behind my forehead goes numb. I'll be there soon, I add, as the cab jerks to a halt. The need to check in with her became worse over the past few years. Sometimes she doesn't call back for hours. Usually she's just on Valium or engaged in her fantasies or deeply ensconced in masterpiece theater. Thanks, PBS, for your riveting programming that has aged me 10 years. I hop on the bus, clutching a Southwestern tuna wrap from Au Bon Pain. The difference in my two lives has never been more apparent. Within a quarter of an hour, I go from an aerial condo to Greyhound, sashimi to sandwich, my chosen family to my birth one, and accordingly, I revert. I find an empty seat. I know this route well. Voyageur is the Canadian branch of Greyhound. Meaning traveler, its rolling French connotes wild adventure, Jules Vernish exploration, sing-along expeditions across the Yukon's blazing horizon instead of the reality. The alcoholic luggage schlepper, the characters who travel back and forth with plastic bags instead of suitcases, and the racist customs officials who interrogate them. Seeing my Canadian passport, their main question is, did you buy anything? Well, I always want to answer. Considering I've been away for 15 years, I have done a touch of light shopping. I text my friend Melissa, who I'm supposed to meet for lunch later that day, a mini celebration for my 33rd birthday. Heading to Montreal, just a little impromptu vacay, I explain, to prevent my mother from hanging herself with her vast collection of pencil cases. I don't say. I check in with mom, still alive. That was Judy Battalion reading from White Walls. Um, next, I'll call up Seth Kugel. And Seth um, first got published in the New York Times in my class and then became the Frugal Traveler, very, very popular Frugal Traveler. And he has an upcoming book, Rediscovering Travel. So he's actually going to be the, um, you're going to hear it before anybody else. Um, you're going to hear a little bit of um, his new book, Rediscovering Travel, which comes out in November. Seth Kugel. Um, just to put this into uh, context, uh, this book questions a lot of conventional wisdom about travel. And in this particular section, I'm questioning the conventional wisdom that someone who doesn't like travel is an idiot. And I need my glasses because I cannot see. Yeah, that's why I need glasses. We're so old. 20 years ago. You hey. Is it possible to dislike travel to actually prefer vegetating? Uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Is it possible to dislike travel to actually prefer vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime, as Mark Twain rather dismissively put it? If you are anything like me and regard travel as an irreplaceable element of a fulfilling life, and the fact that you picked up this book seems to indicate you are, your first instinct may be, that is absolutely preposterous. But if so, I guess you're probably not on a trip right now. Or if you are, you're over your jet lag, 
your stomach is settled, and you haven't gotten lost, and your travel companions are pleasant and agreeable 24 hours a day. As I said, you're probably not on a trip right now. For it is a rare journey that does not involve some level of misery. Travel can be lonely, challenging, uncomfortable, and frustrating at times. Yet before we leave and after we get home, we tend to forget that, in part because the industry markets travel the same way McDonald's markets Big Macs. Lettuce remarkably crisp, buns unsmushed, smushed, indigestion and calorie count never mentioned. Actually, it's not just the travel industry, but also your friends on social media. At this very moment, hashtag waterfall has appeared 7,434,527 times on Instagram. Hashtag squat toilet, just 686. <laughs> Yet people have different levels of tolerance for the discomforts of travel, and not always by choice. Severe allergies or hypersensitivity to gluten, for example, can make traveling a nightmare in places where language barriers can lead to disaster. Being in a wheelchair can make travel to many places almost as complicated for modern travelers as it was for 18th century Londoners to travel to Edinburgh by stagecoach. It also isn't free. Billions, of course, don't have the money or time to travel at all. Even for those who can, travel comes at the real expense of something else. Nicer clothes, a better health plan, financial security. Even for those with plentiful discretionary income, travel also takes up free time when you could be doing something else. What kind of person chooses not to travel? As it turns out, my high school soccer teammate, grad school roommate, and the guy I still talk to every Tuesday night at 9 p.m., John Chapman. John is an exemplary human being who teaches science at a high school for recovering addicts in the Boston public schools and picks up others' litter obsessively. He is beloved among friends for his quick-witted, self-deprecating humor and respected for his extraordinary generosity. His main detractors are those who want to get a word in edgewise when he's on a roll at a dinner party. He also does not like to travel. I requested a formal interview with him, not on a Tuesday at 9, to find out why. His answers were way too reasonable. Uh, quote, I'd rather spend on things that will be longer lasting, that I can use over and over again like a new set of golf clubs, he told me. He did not mention it, but I also know he prioritizes charitable giving, donating a higher percentage of his salary to good causes than anyone else I know. But he has little of the wanderlust that many of us at least think we have. I'm very happy here, he says of Boston. I've never felt the need to escape anything. My parents, the climate, the culture. His ideal trip is an hour-long drive to play golf with his dad. Travel seems like a gamble to him. You've got to plan it out way in advance, he said. And then, geez, well, I hope you don't get strep throat right before your trip. What if you lose your luggage? What if you break your leg? It's not just the physical risk, but the financial risk. Spending a grand and not getting a grand's enjoyment from it? What if you have the flu at Disney World? You're paying $250 a night, and you're throwing up in your $250 a night toilet. Seth Google, that was a preview. You're the first to hear it. Okay, we have two more readers, and then I'm going to ask questions about how everybody got all this successful. Aspen Matus, um, she is going to read a piece from Tin House, which was one of the short pieces that led to her memoir, Girl in the Woods. Aspen Matus and Tin House is a lit the literary magazine I mentioned that Enma has been working for. Um, this is actually a book review of a very old book um, called Travels in Alaska by John Weir. I grew up in a whitewashed room on a hedge-lined suburban street. Blood-red geraniums and poinsettias in dark green plastic pots dotted our lawn, neglected in frequent rain. With the first frost each year, the flowers would freeze, the pots would crack open and spill the soil, black and sweet, that had sustained the plants through months of abandonment. This was nature as I knew it in Newton, Massachusetts. Newton is called the Garden City, Yet in 1959, the town tore out its historic mason school and its huge garden, bright with lilacs and buttercream roses, and poured into the new openness 2,178 tons of asphalt. This lot now offers central parking. The strip of flowers that remains, hugging the asphalt, allows the city to keep its name. Wandering these sidewalks, pacing this strip, I felt like a caged cub. I feared I'd be forever stuck in an artless world until a slim old book I found banished that notion. The paperback was Travels in Alaska, the little red last thing John Muir ever wrote, published p 
posthumously in 1915. It was both essay meets environmentalism meets poetry and a memoir of sorts. It exalted beauty and showed me where to see it in icicles that shatter sunlight into honeyed kaleidoscopes on a spot of snow-blanked ground in the vein-ridged wing of a common moth. It gave me permission to derail my life and leave the Garden City, first for Alaska, then to walk the height of America alone while I was still a teen. I'd found it, brittle and browning, among flat basketballs and insecticide in my family's garage when I was 17, the 1979 trade paperback edition once priced at $5.95, but in this copy that value slashed and marked in pencil at just 75 cents. I opened it and it creaked. The spine cracked in two. I felt a swell of compassion for my parents to think that they had bought this wild old book. They had once fostered desire for something distant, something large, a seed they'd buried, abandoned. But neglected seeds, wild seeds, might still grow. I read the book in my bed that night in hopes of unburying something. I was an unhappy teen. I felt blank, could not sit still. I had no friends. Inside my silent skull, a whiteout, deafening and cold. As I read, I wondered what Mir's life was like before he set off on his adventures. Was he once a misfit kid? Could he li live at peace indoors? Was there a length of time during which Mir was trapped in a civilization rigid and unenlightened, unable to see through the crowds of factories outside his single ruddy window? Had he once felt as I felt? Could I someday be as free and euphoric as he was when he was discovering Alaska for himself, skip jumping over crevasses in America's most virgin spill of peaks so consumed he would forget to eat? Mir hiked and climbed and wrote and wrote and loved the air, the view, the whole moist and sunlit land. He was high on his new smallness. He would not sleep, couldn't. There were too many perfect snowflakes, too many unnamed peaks. And he had to write it here, now, while the blood pumped hot in his arms and his heart. He wrote, when we contemplate, when we contemplate the whole gro globe as one great dewdrop, striped and dotted with continents and islands, flying through space with other stars all singing and shining together as one, the whole universe appears as an infinite st storm of beauty. On my second day of my freshman year of college, before classes had begun, before I'd removed my colorful construction paper name tag from my dorm room door, I was raped. I was broken into a spread of shards. Sure, I was not reconstructible. I dismissed my value. I was lost. One night, I did five shots of vodka back to back in my dorm room alone. I woke up in an argument with a nurse lying in a hospital bed. Before that sad night, I'd never drunk more than two glasses of wine in a sitting. Then I joined an internet dating site and went out with six people in six days and hated them all, and even met one in my room. I almost wished he was, I almost wished he were also a rapist and a killer and would at last end my seasickness that had no shore. I did not forget, though, Mir's words, the hope trails grant. I rushed back to Mir, his books, maps of his treks, my first summer in the Sierra, the Yosemite, the cruise of the Corwin. I skimmed them for lines of places clean and gorgeous. I found strands of gems, glittering arrows, pointing to ridged peaks. In John of the Mountains, he told me, in God's wildness lies the hope of the world, the great, fresh, unblighted, unredeemed wilderness. The galling harness of civilization drops off and wounds heal ere we are aware. In steep trails, he wrote to me, go quietly, alone, no harm will befall you. I answered, yes, yes, I would go. I left school and went to the mountains. Six months after I found travels in Alaska, I was in Alaska. I had talked my parents into paying for the trip. Later that same summer, this time without their blessing and alone, I was hiking the 211 mile John Muir Trail through the high Sierra of California. The John Muir Trail is a segment of the Mammoth Pacific Crest Trail, a lovely blip meandering north. With the manuscript of Travels in Alaska in his rucksack at the end of his life, Muir boarded a train to Los Angeles, sick with pneumonia, hoping the urban doctors might revive him. They did not. He died there. His final, his final ramble before he passed had ended in the desert of Southern California, the southern tip of the Pacific Crest Trail. Post-rape, newly a dropout, I traveled to that same desert and there began my long trek north into shimmering frost, silent glades, 
black and star-edged nights. I carried travels in Alaska not in my knapsack, but in my gut, my tent snug legs, my will. I was hiking alone, north from Mexico toward Canada on the 2,650 mile, devastatingly gorgeous Pacific Crest Trail. On that walk, I met rattlesnakes and bears. I forded frigid and remote rivers as deep as I am tall. I felt terror and the gratitude that followed the realization that I'd survived rape. I was not forever lost. I met myself, my future self, and Justin, the man who would become my husband. Our wedding invitations quoted John Muir, in every walk with nature one receives far more than he seeks. A week ago, Justin found an old copy of Travels Alone Travels in Alaska I'd taken from my parents' garage. It had been wedged onto the tip-top shelf of the narrow cupboard in, in the bathroom of our Greenwich Village apartment between Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and Bonnie Nadsom's Lamb, two great American pilgrimage fictions. I was so exciting it, I was so excited to have it in my hands again that I reread it with a he headlamp through the night. In the morning, I called my father. I told him I had taken Travels in Alaska. I asked him where it had come from, what it had meant to him and mom. He said, you have it? He repeated back to me, by Mir. Then he said he'd never read it, hadn't known they'd had it. He'd never even heard of it. It turned out that Travels in Alaska had mysteriously and fortuitously appeared to bend the tracks of my life and direct me into the wild. And um, Aspen, not only after that piece in a New York Times Modern Love, got a book deal from HarperCollins, which led to a TV option, and she became a spokesperson for Rain. Okay, the last piece we're gonna hear tonight is Lexi Bean, and this piece was uh, Lexi's first publication in Teen Vogue, which led to not only a whole bunch of other publications, two books. Oh, and I'm sorry, and it's on page uh, 76, and it's called Valentine's Day Letter to My Body Parts. I sent myself the only valentine that made me cry. Days alone in a hospital bed, talked between dim lights and a thick language barrier, I could no longer deny how far I tried to run from my own body. I originally admitted myself seeking a diagnosis to understand the hurt I had collected over the years. I was seeking a cure to overcome a feeling as I had made the assumption that healing meant that every day got better. And it just wasn't working out for me. For years, I went in and out of the hospital without a diagnosis. I was simply afraid of my body, heavy with the question, will anyone believe me? I closed the notebook onto my lap, IV dripping into my tired veins. It was from there. I started writing letters to my body parts. I had to make it better by carving out a place for myself instead of carving into my own skin. I am trans. And from a young age, I was sexually and emotionally abused. I rarely place these sentences next to each other because I don't want anyone to confuse my trauma with my liberation, forced into someone else's destination. Nothing about rape taught me to be honest with myself. I grew from a place where telling my body's truth would uproot everything, and language was used to manipulate my boundaries so silence was better. The hurt said it was best to become a see-through version of myself so I didn't have to keep falling into the trauma of fallen toys. Yet, I am often asked when coming out as LGBTQ, do you feel this way because Someone did that to you because you still have healing to do. But who I am has no root and feeling seen is nothing to recover from. I thought that for too long that if identities and dreams were compartmentalized, I would be safer. That I would be more valuable if I were easier to understand, stumbling over my pronouns and sending me back home. People didn't always know what to do with me. 
I could be a sweet girl. I could have a safe suburban family, ignoring everything that didn't fit into their fantasy. So I tried to beat them to the punch by prematurely erasing myself through dissociation, self-diagnosing with anything that could fit into one word, and attempting suicide. There is nothing there is nothing like that subtle yet persistent feeling of being out of place that cuts and cuts and cuts. And I didn't understand until I moved out of my Michigan hometown why almost all of my gay straight alliance friends covered their arms with wristbands from Claire's. So the last year I went to the hospital, I wrote three letters to my body parts. One to my leg hair, one to the space between my hips, and another to the baby teeth that now live in my mother's nightstand. I only wrote to the pieces of myself that I had tried to detach while seeking safety. I was learning how to stay one piece at a time. I was learning how to find a safe space to meet myself with honesty. I had not yet come out as trans. I had sent to my leg hair. I sometimes pretend you are fields of restless wheat that outline my home. I held my knees as I recalled the space between my hips. I feel responsible. You lost a body that can never grow back. You are now unsealed and bore with holes for nightmares to sink into your folds. There is only evidence that someone else was here pushing, pushing, pushing. I catch my breath. And I told my estranged baby teeth, looking into her nightstand, there is only evidence of bodies that were never whole. Children who had never known what it meant to have these baby teeth. Each and all teeth shed served as evidence of he who abused his duties as the tooth fairy. But none of my early letters ended with the word love. And sometimes they still don't. And that's okay. Like healing, relationships are never linear. I wanted every part of me to survive whether or not they were perfect. As in any connection, there are days where it seemed as if the tenderness would last forever. And some days are more like playing hard to get or it's a fight, and sometimes I can't look at the other without seeing the men who kicked me out of my own house. So sometimes peace looks more like conflict, and sometimes positivity looks more like moving and feeling in every direction, and sometimes love looks more like letting the seemingly unlovable parts of me survive. Love, trusting that I will never be just one thing. So this Valentine's Day, I'm going to return to all the parts of myself I tried to cut off for the convenience of others. I'm going to write to my body parts difficult to hold as I seek wholeness in a shape that no one has ever seen before. For the record, I haven't been in the hospital since 2012, the same year I sent my first letters. And um, not only did Lexi Bean publish several pieces in Teen Vogue, um, Lexi's anthology um, came out of that piece, and also um, recent great news um, that Lexi sold a YA novel to Dial Press at Random House. So, mazel tov. Okay, so thank you guys for reading these beautiful pieces. So what I thought, and they're all either in um, or linked to Byline Bible, and what I thought I would do is ask a few questions, then we'll open it up to you guys. So Sharice, out of all the publications you've had, I know you were in a, um, your story was in a play, and now you were asked to be in this anthology. You've sold maybe 50 pieces. What was, what's been the highlight of publishing all these short pieces so far? I mean, was it, was it 
Was it being asked to be in an anthology? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, Tell us how that happened. Um, well, actually, I wasn't, I wasn't asked. I submitted um, a couple of years ago and um, found out maybe about six months after the fact that I was you know, going to have a piece in there. And I, I was just really excited because I knew it would be um, a really important book, but I still didn't know what exactly it would mean for me. Um, but since then, I mean, it's just brought about so many wonderful things. I'm, I have more opportunities now. And even though, as you, because you might have recognized when I read, I'm still very nervous when I read. Um, and so reading pieces that have to do with rape are difficult for me, but I still go and speak to um, very large audiences about the topic because I feel as though it's important to do so. So being in Not That Bad has given me a, a, a very large platform to be able to con continue the work as a rape survivor. So. And um, you're working on your own memoir? Yes. And uh, what was the great title that you had? In Spite Of. In Spite Of. So, that I'm, so we'll do an event um, here when you publish it. OK, um, Ken and I'm going to embarrass him um, with a story that I love, because there's a very happy ending. So um, I helped him write that because he said English isn't his first language, and he works full time as a physical therapist. And he was talking about how because of the eth ethnic cleansing that happened in um, the Balkans when he was 12, he had to leave his country, and he never got to do anything cool before he left. So he never got to go to a bar and have a drink, and he never got to go to a sports game, a real sports game. And I added the line, and I never kissed a girl from home. And he said, take that out. And I'm like, why? And I'm like, but, it, but, it, but it, it says everything, but he was embarrassed. So I talked him into leaving the line in, and then after the book came out, he got about 1,000 emails um, and phone calls from women all over the Balkans and their mothers and sisters and cousins who wanted to meet him. And then he got one without a picture, I remember, from a, a girl named Mirala. Um, who it turns out, oh, and he'd never been to the capital of Sarajevo. He'd never been to the capital of Bosnia. So um, cut to the chase, um, he's now, he met Mirala, he's now engaged, and he has a second family in Sarajevo um, when he goes to visit, and her mother cooks her, him great Bosnian food. And he just told me a great story today. Um, why don't you tell everyone what happened today at her meeting? Oh, she went to the U.S. Embassy, and they, um, right. she... Well, to be, no, I mean, no, to come here, you have to come on type of visa. So you can't come here and get engaged as a tourist because of new laws. So you have to apply for a fiancé visa or marriage visa. So the fiancé visa was the shortest way to get here, even though it took like eight months. So there's so much paperwork involved, like me filing, sending all the proof how we met. I mean, I would, I actually brought to um, uh, the embassy here, uh, immigration office, plane tickets, text messages, my trips, over there, our pictures, everything together. So it took about eight months. She went to an interview this morning, and she passed. So they gave her visa. So she has six months to come here. So. Ah, oh, that too. So she brought two copies of a book, American version and the Bosnian version that was translated. So this is how we met, because I included it in the essay. And the guy, American guy, the consul who interviewed her, he said, oh, I have it right here. He's like, we keep it on our shelf at the embassy. So he read the book, yeah. So they, they knew ahead of time like everything about me because they can Google and you know it's, I, after all it's the government so that's pretty. And luckily cool. it was Americans. It was very pro-American because they yeah. saved him. So yeah. probably happy ending. Okay, so Allison, after years of being an editor and a um, and a and a freelancer, tell us about um, how did it feel when somebody asked you to do '90s bitch and was that that was that one of your highlights so far? Yeah, uh, is this on? Hello? Yes, hi. Uh, 90s Bitch has been definitely the career highlight for me. Um, I've always wanted to write a book, and I never knew what I wanted to write it about, but um, I, I really, I was drawn to this material sort of on a personal level because I was 8 to 18 years old in the 90s, and so uh, when I returned to the decade, it was with a lot of nostalgia and more memories, and like I loved, you know, the Spice Girls and like TLC, but I knew I hated Brenda from 90210, and... <laughs> So I started to kind of, you hate her too. Yeah, I mean, she's, everybody hated her. So, but that's the point is that, you know, all of these women in the 90s, I had these really sort of complex feelings about and I had a lot of negative feelings and I wanted to investigate those with my sort of skill set as a journalist. And what I found when I returned to the 90s was that it wasn't that there was something problematic with the characters of these women. It was that they were victims of sexism and that sexism, the sexist narratives of everyone from Anita Hill to Hillary Clinton to... Shannon Do 
Doherty from 90210, um, that those narratives really came to shape a generation. And I have a whole chapter on girlhood and sort of the ways in which um, these stories really had uh, real world impacts for women and girls and, and even men and boys. And we're just coming to terms with that now. So, Is it exciting that not only do you get to write what you feel, but you get to kind of be a political spokesperson, a feminist spokesperson? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a really important moment. We're sort of in this new terrain, right, with sort of post Me Too. We have new language around these things. I think a lot of people are plugging into the book and saying, you know, this is a framework. It's very, you know, it's a lot of research. It's like 60 pages of footnotes and they're saying well you know this is a framework for talking about the sexism that we've experienced and been gaslit about our entire lives and now it's sort of out in the open these conversations are happening and seeing i think seeing the sexism of the past is really key to sort of moving forward and changing it cool and um uh judy so um, i'm gonna embarrass you with also wonderful news so after writing white walls um and and tell me if i'm getting it right judy was doing research um, tell us about the Yiddish research that you, uh, that you found that led to your new book. Um, well, this was actually many years ago. I, okay. I was serendipitously, I was, look, I was researching uh, the character of Hannah Senish. I don't know if people have heard of her. Um, and I, I was looking for strong Jewish women model, role models uh, for a, a performance project. And I found a, I was at the British Library, I typed it in, I got all these books on Hannah Senish, um, and one of them was in Yiddish. And I happen to have grown up speaking and reading Yiddish. It's rusty, my Yiddish. I don't use it that often. Um, so I took a look at this like 200 page book and, uh, and was like, oh, that's gonna be too hard for me to read. Okay, okay, let me, this researcher in me said, let me just glance through. So I opened the book to look for a story of Hannah Senish, this character, and it's a 200 page book and she only appeared in the last 10 pages. The first 190 pages were stories of other Jewish women who fought uh, in the ghettos, in the resistance, in Poland. Um, and I was just blown away by these stories, by a part of the, sort of my own family's narrative as well that I had no idea about. And that's what I'm writing a book about now. So. Um, and Steven Spielberg has already optioned it for a movie before she's even written the book. So no congratulations, problem. amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, Aspen, so I know you were really young when you, I think you were 21 when you sold the piece to the New York Times and to Tin House, and so it led to a book and to, I know you sold TV rights and you've been a spokesperson for Rain. so which has been the, the most exciting, best part so far? Um, she actually hated book publicity. She's the only one I know yeah. who like <laughs> hated book publicity, so I know I that part say, wasn't fun for you. Yeah, I, I would say when the book sold on proposal was the most exciting, like when I had a book deal. Like, and then- Not writing it, but before. Yeah, and not after it came out. Like, the idea of it was the best. Writing it was also really exciting, and then when it came out, it was just really overwhelming. Okay, and was it exciting for you? I know that you were sent to a lot of different colleges to be a speaker, was that fun? Definitely, yeah, I, I liked talking to, I talked to a lot of like, like, like 7,000 sorority girls in Texas. Um, it was exciting, like I really felt like I could um, touch and impact um, people who were in the same seat I was sitting in when I was 18. Great. I always think that um, writing can be so empowering, just, uh, just three pages, the power of the press. So Seth, so you've traveled all around the world. You had the most amazing job that everyone was jealous of, getting paid to travel. And so now you're going to be, um, I, I bet you'll be traveling around the United States to, um, to, to um, do publicity for rediscovering travel? Um, well, we'll see. I gotta plan it out. Luckily, I just met with Sue a couple days ago and she helped me with everything. Um, but, um, yeah. What's the most exciting part so far? Is it, was it getting the galley or is it gonna be when you, um, when you see the no, book? No, definitely the most exciting part was after about three and a half years of doing it part-time when I actually finished the first manuscript and handed it in to my editor. It's all been a little bit downhill from there, as they told me what I had to change. But uh, the first, the, that first, I, uh, I went, I'm a very distracted person. And I'm sure some of you are distracted as well. And I always say, OK, I'm going to do three hours of writing this morning, and then I'm going to go do all the other stuff I have to do. But it turned out I had to go leave the country to finish this book, but not to a rural area. I cannot get anything done in a rural area. So I went to Lisbon. Um, and just 
got a cool apartment on Airbnb in, near a cool cafe and finished it there in a month and was very, very happy. Cool. Congratulations. And Lexi, so it's, I think, seven pieces in a row for Teen Vogue, an anthology, um, getting a big literary agent, and now a book deal from Dial Random House. So what's been the most exciting part of it? I think the most exciting part is learning to trust my own voice, because that's the foundation of everything. And the most exciting moment was having having something to hold and knowing that I survived because of it and also um, the power of making an anthology specifically is knowing that I'm not alone in my experience and that it will always exist alongside other people and it will also become a support group that I can keep next to my bed and knowing that I couldn't have written it alone and trusting other people with my story and other people trusting me with their story is a really big gift. And you also told me, you reminded me that three years ago you first came to one of my strand panels. Yeah. So I love that. So now she's on the panel. So I love that. So that's so exciting. So I'm going to ask one more question, then we're going to open it up to you. So I know there's a lot of writers here or people that um, they actually did a study and they said something like 85% of people of all fields think they have a book in them. So what advice do you give to a group of people either who are writing or who have a, have a secret book in them? So Sharice, you've had so much success and I know you're working on a book now. So what, what kind of publishing advice do you give to, um, to people that are just starting out? Take Sue's class. I paid them to say that. <laughs> That's, aside from that. No, I mean seriously. I mean, did you um, teach your MFA at, at I, I did. I went to um, went to the new school and got my MFA. But prior to that, I did um, Gotham's writing um, memoir classes online for a couple of years and really just tried to work on my voice. I mean, I, you couldn't keep me from writing. I've been writing all my life, whether it's a long text or a diary. Um, so I. I just always knew that I would find my way to writing, but I didn't even know what an MFA program was, to be honest with you, 10 years ago. Um, so it was a mentor that, um, that kind of steered me in that direction. But really, I, if you believe you have a book in you, you probably do. And the best thing to do is just pursue it, really by any means necessary, because all of our stories are important. Awesome, and I agree with Sharice that um, take classes if you're interested in writing, and um, I'll give out my card if anybody wants information. And also, I'm doing a, another event on for charity on um, September 21st with a bunch of different editors and agents. So that will be all about the nitty gritty of how many pages you need for a proposal and how do you sell stuff. Um, so um, great, Kenan. Um, so you were not. You didn't think you were a writer. You're a physical therapist. He's a, a very acclaimed physical therapist. Um, and you didn't even know that it was possible to write a book. So what advice do you give to people that might be in another field or be wor working full time, you know, doing something else? Be vulnerable, take criticism, expect a lot of rewrites, revisions. And as Sue says, no never means no in publishing, just find a different angle. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, good. Oh, and I have one other trick, which is if you can't afford to take a class or you don't have the time, um, one of my secret tricks is ghost editors, which means that you can write something, whether it's a, a short piece, I mean, you heard all kinds of different, um, different kinds of writing, whether it's an essay, an op-ed, um, a nonfiction piece, and you can hire a ghost editor to help you, and also you can hire a ghost editor to help you with a book. And one of my favorite ghost editors, Angie Chen, happens to be here, so, and she specializes in um, kids, all kinds of children's books, and YA fiction and nonfiction. So Angie, where are you? Yeah, so if anybody wants to know what a ghost editor does, go ask um, Angie, because that's one of my tricks. And I'll just, uh, um, come sit down, Norma. There's some seats here. But um, really quickly, I'll tell you a, a good story, which is I had, I've been trying to sell a book for seven years and couldn't. And I was helping all my students get published. And I was like the wedding planner who couldn't get married. I was really frustrated. And um, I, my shrink suggested that I ask, I had two people that just sold books, two friends of mine, and they, she suggested, uh, he suggested I, take them to lunch or dinner and get their advice. So I t picked their brains, so I went to lunch with Larry and I said, is there any advice you could give? I have this book I've been trying to sell for seven years. And he said, um, yeah, don't tell anyone, but there's this, this ghost editor I use named Sally who is from Doubleday. Here's her phone number. 
Um, she was awesome. You should hire her. And then I went to lunch with Yona, a dinner d with Yona, who had had a, a big fiction deal, novel deal. And I said, you know, is there any advice you could give me about telling my manuscript? She said, this is just between us, but there's this great ghost editor named Sally who used to work at Doubleday <laughs> that I work with. So I contacted Sally, but she was going to be like $2,500. So I said to the shrink, I can't afford that. That's ridiculous. The whole idea of writing a book is to make money. He's like, are you an idiot? Two people told you, two people you trust who got huge book deals. Go for it. Just put it on your charge card. Do something. So I did. I put it on my charge card. I worked with Sally. I spent about $3,000 having her ghost edit the book. And then my first advance from Random House was $50,000. And it led to um, 12 foreign rights, TV film deal, and 11 other books. So I swear by ghost editors. So if anybody wants to email me to get more information, I'll be happy to uh, share it with you. Now, Allison, you've been an editor and you've been a writer. So what advice do you give to people that are um, interested in um, just starting out or, um, you know, like pitching a piece to an editor? Uh, I think a lot of times we don't think of expertise as sort of a broad thing. Like we think we may be an expert in the law because we're a lawyer. We might be an expert in, you know, this particular thing. But I think you should think about expertise really broadly if you want to place pieces and particularly if you want to share your opinions. You know, it can be you can be an expert because you are Southern. You can be an expert because you, you know, like take care of pets and you like dogs. That, that makes you an expert, too. And I also think I love this quote. Um, I think a lot of writers have like a lot of work that they've never shared with anybody. They like may have maybe have a book in a drawer or something like that. I, you know, I I wrote it like almost. I think I wrote an entire memoir that is like in my drawer, and I just knew it wasn't right, and I have never published it, and probably won't ever do it. But it was really good practice. So like I don't think that those things are waste of time. I think like keep going. Like I love the quote, um, "Gut feelings are guardian angels." Like I knew that that book like did not need to be in the world, but it was really good practice. So and it and it served a purpose. Great, Judy. So now you have a memoir out. You've done. I, I think you were doing a lot of the um, the great parenting pieces for Motherload at the New York Times, and now you're researching a big nonfiction book that's going to be a movie. So what advice do you give to people? And and by the way, I remember you saying that it, you struggled for a long time to get to this place. So what advice do you give to people that um, that want to do books or um, you know? get published? Um, sure, so I, I, exactly. I, the advice is mostly what I try to give myself, uh, which is be patient. Um, I, you know, today I've actually been working on a TV adaptation of this book as well. I was working on it today. And there's still problems. There's still things I couldn't figure out in the character. And I was like, why is it doing And I was like, oh my god, I started working on this nine years ago. And the book is out, and I still don't even know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, like between getting these clips and publishing, I'm finding an agent and publishing a book. It took a long time. It took me years to to build up to where I am. But I'm the kind of person that like I want to be finished something before I start it, and I have to every day I have to talk myself out of that, and and to sort of just let time happen. Things do happen over time. Yeah, I, okay. I remember my, with my first novel, I remember um, from the start until it got published was 13 years. So instead of a book launch, it got a book mitzvah. Remember you were there? <laughs> yeah, you guys were there. And then I yeah. have one practical thing of advice. And I am not the kind of writer that can just sit and write by myself for hours and kind of thing. I, I need external deadlines. And even if that means like, a friend who's going to, a writing friend who's I'm going to meet at a coffee shop in a week who's going to read something. I need, I need the sense of an audience, of some reality in the world. Um, I, I cannot do things without Oh yeah, the people. writing group. I, 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 I like will pay people, like I will pay you to make a deadline for me. <laughs> I need it to come from the outside and to feel some pressure to, to, um, yeah, classes are great for that, and we have a weekly writing group. So where where you your deadline, you have to bring in pages, and people critique it. Aspen, so um, what advice do you give to people that uh, you were you were going back to undergrad at the New School, and then you um, you published three pieces? I think I remember it was um, New York Times Modern Love Psychology Today and Tin House, and then you got you did the book proposal, you got the book deal. So what advice do you give to people that want to start out? Uh, takes his class. I pay everybody to say that. That's really, <laughs> it's really the best advice I can give. But um, what other advice do you give to oh, people uh, that take feedback? Like, don't assume that you're the exception to the rule. I think like when I first took Sue's class, um, I really thought like, oh, she's like brilliant. 
when she come when she talks about anyone else's work, but when it comes to my work, <laughs> like she just doesn't have the ear. She you did the um, you did the poetic. <laughs> remember, you did she did poetry line breaks that she wanted to send oh, yeah, to the I New wanted, York Times. I wanted to publish um, my modern love with line breaks, and Sue was like, "Doesn't matter, like how much you want this. Like the New York Times is never going to publish line breaks. They don't publish poetry." Um, so I took out the line breaks, but. Um, Good, Seth. So you, if I remember correctly, you, um, I remember you, pu you got published, um, Seth spoke Spanish and he worked in the Bronx and you started publishing a lot of short pieces in the New York Times, I remember first, and then you moved over to travel and now this is your second book. So what kind of advice do you give people that um, either want to do travel writing or, or um, you know, want to want to get to the time? Well, I'd repeat, whoa, geez. <laughs> I'd repeat the, uh, the advice that Take advantage of whatever you're an expert at. I just happened to have a job in the Bronx and 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 speak spoke Spanish. And at the time, the the, the New York Times had very few Latino reporters, uh, and and so I sort of filled in for them. And so I got a lot of stuff published. But the the I want to give a piece of advice that um, that I learned from an editor um, who asked me after I'd been writing for like five years for him. He said, "Hey, Seth, are you the kind of writer that?" likes writing or are you the kind of writer that hates writing and i was like what it's an option thank god <laughs> you know there's a lot of i i i really don't like the part where i sit down and tap on the keyboard um i'm a reporter i'm a journalist i love researching stuff i like interviewing people i like thinking about stuff i like making an outline i even like editing after i've already written something so i guess my advice is don't worry if the actual act of writing is really hard, because it is. Good, Lexi, what advice do you give to people that are just, uh, that want to do books? Or um, that want to write for Teen Vogue? Two things come to mind. Um, one is not being attached to a specific form a story is going to take. For example, the, the middle grade story that uh, Sue was referencing before, it started out as a picture book and I thought, this is it, this is it. And no agent wanted it. And so then I made a five minute animation based off of it. And still no one wanted it. And then I kept playing with it. I thought maybe it was just gonna be like a series of scenes or like a bunch of poems. And then now it's, uh, now it's a 240 page like novel. Um, and I'm not even attached to that either. Like it could, it could also take another form. So just knowing that it can take different forms in order to tell the truth. Um, and the other thing is, is just learning how to straddle being unsafe versus uncomfortable in your content. Um, and I really wanna encourage everyone to be uncomfortable, but to acknowledge when do you feel physically or like mentally unsafe sharing what you're sharing. And I think uh, my <laughs> anthology is a good example. So it's full of letters that fellow trans and non-binary domestic violence and sexual assault survivors have written to their body parts. And the, this secret is that in the process of putting this book together, over the two years of putting it together, I stayed in a bad relationship and was spending all this time holding other people's stories and supporting them directly and indirectly and not giving myself that. And so if you are writing something that involves collecting other people's work or something that is emotionally intense or fragile, check in with yourself. By the way, I, um, therapy really helped me. In fact, I actually yeah. got a book. I was doing addiction therapy with a great therapist, and I was taking notes, and I wanted help, and it actually turned into another book. <laughs> so that, that um, and I, if you email me, I could recommend not only e ghost editors, agents, therapists. <laughs> so um, quick question. Ralph, Haig, and Enma, you shared beautiful work, and you've all been published a lot. Do you have anything to add to any, any of the advice that people have given? Um, I definitely think listening to other people's criticism really helps and kind of just leaning more into, this is more of a social work term, but leaning into the discomfort of what you're saying, especially when you're writing about yourself. 
Um, I think a lot of times you kind of try to hide the elephant in the room of what you're writing and you kind of want to gloss over it, but Sue will definitely tell you like that's where it is, you know, um, lean into that. Good. Hi. Uh, along the lines of writing is so hard. Um, in my experience, I often said things to myself like, oh, this is so stupid as I was writing. You're so stupid. But once in a while, I would say, oh, this is pretty good. And listen more to the p voices in your head that say, this is pretty good. That'll help more than the beating yourself up. Good. Ralph, any advice? Don't be afraid to embarrass yourself. I mean, the, the stuff that I wrote, I was afraid what my kids were going to think of it when they read it, especially me eating from the garbage can. But you told me just put it all out there, so I said, what the hell, right? So just, just do it. Yeah, my rule is that the, 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 your worst experiences, writing can turn your worst experiences into the most beautiful. So we have time for some questions, and you can ask anybody here um, any question you want. So um, yes, right there. I, I got really good. She, she's asking about um, when you're writing something autobiographical, how do you decide to do fiction or nonfiction? And I had that exact problem with my first book, Five Men Who Broke My Heart. I went back to re-meet my top five heartbreaks of all time to find out what really happened. And um, I was trying to figure out, since I was fictionalizing a few things and changing names because I didn't want to get sued and I didn't want my husband to divorce me. So I was like, what do I call this? So I had this brilliant friend, um, Deborah, who was an editor at Knopf and pa Pantheon. So I told her the whole story and I said, so do I call it fiction or do I call it um, a memoir? So she told me this great line. She said, a novel that is merely autobiographical is a great disappointment, but a memoir that reads like a novel is a great surprise. So I stayed with that. So meaning that if you're gonna write a memoir, it can't just be then this happened, then this happened. You have to really shape it and make it exciting so that, um, you know, so that it reads like a novel. Um, and also, um, I was able to write a note. If you change things, you could just write an author's note and get away with it. So my author's note for five men wrote, names, dates, and personal characteristics have been changed for literary cohesion to protect privacy and so my husband wouldn't divorce me. So you can absolutely, if you're changing certain names or facts, you can absolutely change them. And if you're gonna do it for fiction, I think you have to really go a little crazier. You can't just stick to the real facts. Anybody else have any, anything they wanna add? Judy? I started writing this as fiction, and uh, an editor wanted me to do it as fiction. And it, I, it was like my life story, but like instead of being in Montreal, it was in Los Angeles. Like it didn't make sense, and it felt artificial to me. And I think that's when I knew, like, why am I, why am I fictionalizing it? It felt like I was, I was, I was making, I was contriving something. I was adding a layer instead of getting to the truth of it. Interesting. Other questions? Yes. Um, so this is, kind of, this is for like anyone who feels the most strongly. Um, when you're trying to decide like what to pursue, what to edit, and then put out there, how do you make that decision? I mean, the one good thing about having classes is you get assignments. So I will say, I think everybody started out taking classes where the first assignment is write three pages on your most humiliating secret. So that's what's due. And weirdly, those some of those pieces just turn out to be brilliant. But so I give, in a 15-week class, I give 14 different assignments. So that's one way. Um, I also do a writing group. So um, again, I like Judy said, I need deadlines. So I give myself deadlines, even if it's just like five or six pages. But other, other comments, how do other people decide? Lexi. Yeah, um, definitely just going timely. The, the piece that I read today, I initially just wrote it as an essay. And Sue always talks about making things timely as a way to to break into certain publications, so I added the Valentine's Day layer that wasn't in my initial draft. And when I reached out to Teen Vogue about the piece, they, they actually weren't responding. And then it was the day before Valentine's Day last year, and I reminded them that Valentine's Day is tomorrow, and <laughs> they ran it the next day. Yeah. I think it's also about, like, what are you obsessed What do you want to be talking about in writing the story you want to be telling? Because the 
the chances are you will be with this material for a while and you don't want to sort of like waste all your energy on something you don't care about. I also think a goal is good. Like I'm looking at Thomas and, and in our class, the goal was you had to write and publish a great piece by the end of the class. And so he wound up publishing a fantastic piece in Out Magazine. I'm looking at a lot of students who, um, you know, had, they made a goal, like what's your goal? So if you've never been published, then maybe the goal is just you wanna see your work in print. Um, some people are broke and they wanna make the most amount of money possible. And I have a student who made $4,000 for a 2,000 word piece and then got a $150,000 deal from Scribner's. Um, some people, um, and, and actually um, Ken and Allison come to mind right now and, and actually um, with your piece and with Lexi's, some people are political and they have a really, they, they feel they really, want to speak out about something very strongly that they don't think people understand. And so that's a really good goal, you know, and you get, um, you know, a Wall Street Journal op-ed, 500 words, which is like two pages, you get $400 and 1 million people read that. You know, so, so I think if you get a goal in your mind, even if it's just a small goal, it doesn't have to be a book, what do I want? What do I want with the first piece of writing? Um, I think that, that that crystallizes it a little bit. Good time for a few more questions, yes? What do you guys think? What do you think? Okay. I, I think everybody's different. I mean, just for an example, I know Ralph happened to meet an editor named Eli Reyes who came to the class who was just very, very cool and open and said, send me work. And I think actually, Emma, didn't you meet James Toronto from the Wall Street Journal? So sometimes if you meet an editor, and part of the reason why I do so many events with editors and agents, sometimes you meet an editor who just sounds cool and, and they're open-minded and they wanna take something new, that's, that's a reason. You know, that could do it. Um, Aspen actually asked me very specifically, um, I want to get a book deal. What's the fastest way to get a book deal? Because she didn't want to get a nine to five job and she was um, in school and her parents were saying like, okay, when are you moving home kind of thing? So she asked me like, what's the quickest way to get a book deal? And, and the quickest way to get a book deal in my experience is the New York Times Modern Love column um, is, uh, has led to like 50 books. And, uh, and actually, I see my friend Amy Klein is there. We have a club where a bunch of us have gotten into a modern love, but Aspen's led to a book directly. Like, literally, the editor, the vice president of HarperCollins read her piece in the New York Times Sunday section and wanted her book and bid on her book. So, you know, so, so I would say, um, you know, think of what your goal is, but you can absolutely, you can aim high, but I would say, be realistic. So, you know, I always say don't finish a piece at three in the morning, decide it's brilliant and send it to the New Yorker. Make sure that you have, are you in a class? Do you have a mentor or teacher who could look at it? If not, hire a ghost editor. So you don't wanna, you know, you don't wanna irrationally send stuff to the top editors if you don't have help. Good, final question, yes. my question, which is placed, it's like there's so many options here. And how do you target this is a huge well, actually, you know, in my book, I do say, what is your goal? What is your goal? Because it's, if you've never been published and your goal is just, I want my work to see print, you would go to really different places. I want my work to see print quickly. I mean, you can get in the Huffington Post or on Medium tomorrow, if that's your goal, just to see yourself in print. Um, if your goal is prestige, um, then I would say, I know with, with Charisse and actually Judy and, and I think um, Aspen, they really, if their goal was to be in the New York Times, I think they really targeted where in the New York Times could I fit in. And there's probably about 25 places that will take freelancers. But so you have to say to yourself, which, which column do I want to break into? Yeah, oh, Kenan too. Um, you know, so I think that, uh, like I said, if you want to make the most amount of money, don't look at newspapers, look at paper magazines. So Esquire, GQ, Cosmo, Marie Claire, those are the ones that are going to pay two, or Oprah, those are the ones that are going to pay you two or three dollars a word. If you want to get a book deal based on a short piece, then I think there's, um, you know, you have to go prestigious. So um, Tin House is great. Modern Love, New York Times Modern Love is great. The New Yorker is great. So I would really say, what do you want from this? You know, ask yourself that first. Good, any, yes. Well, also, also, where does your piece fit in, right? Because I work for the New York Times travel section. Someone sent me something the other day and said, here's a great idea for the New York Times travel section. 
and it was like nothing that's ever in the travel section. It was like a news story about something that was happening. So if your, if your piece fits in a publication, if it sounds like other thing, pieces from that publication, that might be the place to start. And also, I mean, if you once you get a goal, like if your goal is to get into, I have a couple students whose their goal in life was the New Yorker. So let's study the New Yorker. So it turns out that the easiest way to break in the New Yorker is the newyorker.com has a few sections that are open to freelancers. And one of them is the shouts and murmurs humor section, which is four to 600 words of humor. So I have a few students who really targeted that. And now they've broken into newyorker.com. Some of them have written several pieces. And they also have another section section, um, the technology section takes third person stories. So I had a student who um, had an idea for a third person story that he wanted to pitch. They said yes, published it, got a book deal offer from Simon & Schuster. But so you want to think of, um, sometimes think of what your goal is and then go back and read. When I wanted to be in the New York Times Magazine, um, they used to have a specific column, uh, the lives column. When I wanted to be in, I went back, went to the library. This is the, in the, the days before online, so I literally had to look at microfiche. But I read 100 pieces, and I realized the idea that I was going to do was completely wrong. I was going to do this funny piece about how I wore all black to my wedding, and I thought, oh, that'll make a great lives column. But I read all the lives columns, and they were really gut-wrenching and heavy. So then I went back and rewrote my piece, and instead of just being funny, and cool about it, I threw in my dead grandmother and um, you know my mother was an orphan and I made it much deeper and darker, brought it into my writing group, they liked it, and then I sold it on my first try. And there's this great line, the harder you work, the luckier you get. So decide where you want to be, but before you rush to send something out, you know, I would say take the read read 20 or 30 pieces. I mean, part of the reason I fought all these brilliant pieces and links, I fought to have 60 pieces and about 200 links in here because I feel like the best way to get published is first read a whole bunch of pieces and then, um, you know, and then submit. Great. Any final questions? Okay, great. I just wanted to thank everybody for coming tonight, and I want to um, I want to um, repeat the names. So Ralph Ortiz read his beautiful piece from AM New York. Haig Chahanian read his piece from Oprah Magazine. Emma Elias read her beautiful piece in Wall Street Journal. Sharice Tracy has not, not only has tons of clips you can look up, but she has a great piece in Not That Bad, edited by Roxanne Gay. Kenan Trebinchevich, you could buy his book, The Bosnia List. Um, Allison Yarrow, her book is now out. And by the way, we're all going to hang out and sign books if you guys want to um, want to get them. 90s Bitch. And uh, Judy is the author of White Walls, and now she has a new book and a new uh, movie coming out. Aspen's book is available in paperback. Girl in the Woods, Harper Collins. Seth Kugel, you, you got a preview of his book. You can look up his work online, and in November, you can, you can advance order rediscovering travel. Yep. And uh, Lexi's um, anthology, Written on the Body, is available now. And um, Lexi's YA novel, um, probably next year, right? 2020. 2020, great. And uh, Byline Bible just came out. And again, thanks to the Strand Bookstore and especially Peter. And thank you guys for coming out. And we're going to hang out if you want to say hi and have us sign books. Thank you.